Good morning. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some of you are still awake, yeah? Very good. Such a joy to be here. Uh, almost two months back, I spoke at a conference like this in Hyderabad uh, called Lead Talks, and I titled my message as God's Sense of Humor. And that sense of humor continues in this session. Morning, you have the dynamic Jay Abraham, right? Then you had the happy Anand Pillai. I don't know whether, is he there or gone? Yeah. Uh, then you're going to get a lot of blessings from Ashish after my session. And in between, I was sandwiched, and I don't know what I'm going to speak, right? So that's how God chooses, and the topic they have given me is leadership influence. Before you think I'm somebody, I want to really caveat two, two or three things. Uh, some of you might have seen the promo, uh, young, good-looking guy. Um, so that was my picture 10 years back. I'm the same guy, but our media team thought uh, if they put this gray hair guy, nobody will come. He will be so boring. So they, they chose a picture of 10 years back. And all the titles, I think I, sh I still remember, somebody called, I said, okay, is it okay to put your title? I said, okay, it's okay. But on the day of conference, I'm not going to be there in that company. I knew that that was coming through. But anyhow, so I have a story, which is God's story in my life, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And I can't really throw in all the scriptures, all the intellect which you already got. I don't want to overload because I don't have any how. I only thing which I have is real practical stories, right? And as you can see my gray hair, I have 29 years experience. So if you need to put a timeline like this, this is how my career looked like. Since it's all about leadership, I went back, right, and I kind of put it into a few sessions. My first 20 years of my life, where I grew up in a very small town in Andhra, went to a government school and a government college, but God was still in the shadows. Uh, never did anything great. I was okay academically, but in a government school setup, how much uh, you can be okay is your imagination. Uh, hopefully none of you went to a government college. Uh, so my first leadership role was not in the school or a college. Um, I started playing cricket at age 16, got selected at a state level, and within one year, that's what God did. That's my first kind of a God sense of humor. But my first leadership role was uh, to be the captain of the district cricket team under 22. I was 18 years old. And to be honest, I was not even expecting to be in the team. And they announced my name as the captain. And that's my first leadership experience. And Always I was a very proud young boy. Proud because I was, not because I was something, uh, but I was the youngest of seven children. I was more like a Joseph in the home. We didn't have much money for a colored robe and all that. But, but I was a pampered young child. So, and hence I was a very proud guy because I got the best of what my parents could uh, afford. And suddenly, I was the captain, which means I have power. I can sell it who will play in the 11. I can sell it their batting order. I can sell it who will bowl. I am all powerful. I was all puffed up. So much so, I even took on my coach. And my coach said, you need to do this, this, this. I said, no, no, no. I'm the boss on the cricket ground. I will decide what to do. That was my first leadership experience. So don't think I'm a perfect leader. I am not. Right? That's how I started my first leadership journey. Then at age 20, I joined a government bank as a clerk. And the next 11 years, I spent uh, technically four banks because of uh, acquisition, but three banks, if you can look at. And I was one of the best workers, at least I thought so. And everybody said, even including a government bank, I still remember, I will never forget this. I was so good at my work. And one day, my senior manager in the bank came and said, look, I need your help. I was sitting in a cash, counting cash. 
And you can imagine, what is there to be excellent in counting cash? Those days, no missions. I used to count 300 notes in a minute. But I used to, because I was young, and God has blessed me with some kind of a intelligence, my, my senior manager said, I need your help. There is an audit report. We are not able to reconcile the accounts. I will sit in the cash counter. You sit in my cabin and help us with this. Again, I was very puffed up. Right? Look, I was still a clerk, but I'm sitting in manager's cabin. He's sitting in the cash cabin. So I was very good at work. But let me tell you, 11 years never got promoted in any one of the banks. I was so arrogant. I still remember I was part of the setup team of uh, one of the banks called IDBI Bank, which still exists. And one day, the manager said, you need to open this account. And you know, when you start up a bank, you will do sales guy, John will know. You, you want to do anything to build a business because you don't have much business anyhow. So he wanted to open a Benami account. And he said, OK, Mohan, please open. And I looked at it. I said, no, this is not right. This is not right. And I told him. And he said, no, no, no. I asked you to open. He was a vice president. I was just still an entry level guy. And he said, I am telling you do it. I said, you want me to do it? I took a red pen, wrote all the things which are wrong in it. And I said, OK, can you please sign? Then I will open. And he got frightened. He said that, look, you want to make auditors work easy. That's the reason you wrote it in red ink, and you want me to sign. I said, look, if you don't want to sign, you go and get it done through somebody. I shouted at him. So that's the kind of a person I was. It is not good enough. Morning Jaya talked about competence and character. Let me tell you, both I had, but still didn't make me a good leader. Right? So character and competence alone is not enough because I didn't have love. The compassion bit. Right? I'm not saying you need to do all those things, but how you respond. So that's how I kind of started my leadership journey. And finally, I became an assistant manager with five people. That's not because I was promoted, but I changed the bank. So, so that's how my leadership journey started. But then you can see I hit a purple patch. As I say, right? You can see the color between 31, 36 years age. Uh, I joined this multinational bank and hit the purple patch. In four years' time, uh, five years' time, I was promoted five times. I was an assistant manager in a private bank in India. I became a senior vice president of a multinational global bank. Never applied for a role. I was called in, and I was given the promotions. How did it happen? Morning question I was talking about. Nobody will look at. In fact, they made a big thing about my promotions. I was in the town halls. He's the kind of a blue-eyed boy. Look, if you are good, this is what will happen. And I have to tell them, I was equally as good in the previous 11 years, never got promoted. Right? So that's what has happened. Highly favored at work, God gave that promotion, and uh, I was, again, you know, the kind of a proud guy I was. I was on a high, right? Walking on water, right? Maybe even in the air. So that's what has happened. So that's my first part of my leadership journey. But that's when God, in His grace, took me to Singapore, 2007. Uh, Anand Pillai was one of the faculty. Uh, and I still remember, morning he put his quote, let your, he didn't put the full quote, he said, let your careers, careers be not be barriers, but carriers of gospel. That's when it hit me hard, why God put me at my marketplace? Why I work? It's no longer I work for myself or for earning, there is a grandeur purpose why God put you at work. By that time, God gave me fame, fame, positions, and everything, not because I was worthy, but that's how he prepared and also started working in me. So that's what has happened, and that's the reason I said, okay, the next phase is a very different phase. So the calling has happened around 38 years or around 11 years back, and we started a prayer group in the bank I worked. It's a global bank, and again, a lot of us are so enthusiastic in terms of witnessing and all that. 
So I wanted to start a prayer group with a simple message. It took me 17 years to realize my work is my calling, my ministry. I wanted to tell every Christian in the company, globally, that they need to take their work as their calling. So that's how we started this MOF prayer group, and we titled it Transforming Our Workplace Through Transformed Individuals. So if every Christian can be transformed inside out, our workplaces will be very different than what God wants us to be. So that's where we started. Then we had an interface, which is a, a, a platform for 3040 corporate fellowships. And the third one, God at Work, has started right here in Bangalore in 2009, where very similar conference. So the reason I'm sharing is that's when we realize why we work. Again, the question back to you is, why do you work? Is there a grandeur purpose to work rather than just for a living? But the biggest breakthrough in terms of my leadership happened around nine years back. Again, Singapore has some special place. I went there. Uh, again, God orchestrated that. And I went into this program called Lead Like Jesus. Uh, the, just the word, Lead Like Jesus, attracted me. Uh, Ken Blanchard was there, and uh, we went there, two of us. One from Bangalore, I was in Hyderabad. And my perspective of leadership completely changed upside down at that time. Right? And that's what I want to really spend most of the time of how I, as a leader, was transformed. Okay? So, so I'll quickly go through my leadership transformation. My surname is Patnaik, okay? So you can see the leader in the surname itself, Nayak, right? And I thought I was a born leader. And because of the fame God gave, I became a very arrogant, proud leader. So much so, when I'm on a high, uh, my colleagues nicknamed me something else, which you will see. But also, as I said, that I was very good at work, which means I became a crisis man. Wherever there is a problem, okay, Mohan needs to be posted because he's the one who can douse the fire, build the teams. So I had a good reputation in terms of my competence and track record. But during that time, because I didn't know how to handle this fame, I also acquired the title Kalnaik. Okay, if you don't see the movies, that's the movie that was going on at that time. And I became a wrong leader. It is not that, you see, I was still a Bible reading good Christian. It's not that I'm doing things wrong. I stood for my values. I took on people. I took for, uh, stood for my faith. But the how aspect was dead wrong. Many times we don't realize the importance of love in leadership. And that's what I'm going to kind of share, how God transformed me from a Kalnayak to back to the Nayak or the leader he will be pleased with. So that's the journey I'm going to share. I'm going to share a lot of stories, real stories, right? And that's what I want to do. So going back to leadership, and Jaya talked about earlier in the morning, the definition of leadership. So my own leadership discovery started only in 2010. I used to work for this company in 2000, and there was a young man, I was uh, AVP at that time, uh, who was a fresher, entry level. So one day he called me, and he said, uh, Mohan, I want to, the aha moment which I have titled, I said, I want to come and meet you over a coffee. I remember his name. I couldn't really place him. I said, OK, let's meet so-and-so period. So he came. We met. He brought a very expensive gift. Uh, and he said, I just want to meet you to thank you for being my hero. I said, come again. What did you say? I just want to thank you for being my hero. And we are meeting after 10 years. I left that bank. He also left that bank. He went into a different journey. And that's when it really hit me hard about leadership 
as an influence process. Uh, the long story short is this. He said, so tell me how I was your hero. We never worked with each other. He said, in 2001 or 2000, uh, I had a problem with my performance appraisal. I came to you seeking an appointment. You immediately gave and gave me a time. And on that day, I was waiting at your cabin. You called your desk phone. And I was, we had two offices. I was running late for the uh, meeting. And I just called the desk phone, hoping that he'll be there. Sure enough, he was there. I said, so-and-so, uh, I'm running late. Uh, I'll be there in five minutes. I'm sorry. Just wait, and I'll come and meet you. All I did is a simple courtesy call, which most of us will do when you are running late. But that little call left a lasting impression in him. He said, from that day, you don't need to do that, but you did it. From that day, I was watching you and following you without me knowing that. Right? Every word I spoke, he was watching, he was listening. Every moment I have taken, every action I have taken, he's watching. Now, the reason I'm sharing is, this story I heard after 10 years. Something as small as that left a lasting impression on somebody who became a vice president in those 10 years, comes back to tell you thank you. So my question to you is, leadership is not about position, it's about influence. Yeah? And that's the reason why I love this uh, definition which Jaya talked about, Anytime you seek to influence, and I think Anand talked about how many of you speak, I believe everybody who speaks influences the thinking of another person. As of now I'm speaking, makes you think, right? Every word, words have power. The question is, how are we influencing, positive or negative? Well, I was happy to hear that positive story. My mind went into how many times I have negatively influenced. And the bottom line is, for, this is for each one of us in this room. People are watching. You influence and impact people by what we say and what we do. Right? What we believe they may not know, but what we say and what we do is something which we need to look at. But as I really dwelled into this thing you know, of influence or leadership, the best form of leadership definition came None from, but Jesus from Matthew 20, 25 to 28. Though Jaya mentioned that, I want to reiterate. What kind of a leader you and me need to be? It's not, not about want to be, but need to be. There are only two kinds of leaders in this world. One are driven leaders. Jesus described them like this. And this is a conversation between Jesus and his disciples when the disciples were really kind of a fighting for positions, one on the right, one on the left. Isn't it what, that's what we look for in our corporate jobs? Right, when will I get promoted? Right, what position, what title? I used to be like that, don't, don't get me wrong. I used to be very, really uh, kind of a obsessed with titles. Right, and but titles itself can create a, your downfall. So he said that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. So that's the worldly definition of a leader which we see, and that's where we are in our marketplace, or most of the time. But unfortunately, Jesus didn't give an option. He said, not so with you, and he defines what kind of a leader he expects you and me to be. Right? Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. It doesn't end there. He also says, just like as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The question to you is, if you are still awake, how many of you wants to be servants? Raise your hands. Very few. Okay? Slowly it is going up. How many of you want to be slaves? Ah, oh, very few. Okay, hardly any. Right? Now, why we don't want to be servants? That word we don't like, right? Actually, if you see, go and find out how many times 
Bible talks about leadership versus servanthood. Can anybody guess? Only three times it talks about leadership. Servanthood is 1,100 times. Now, if you are not still convinced, if you think it's a bad idea to be a servant leader, let me tell you, all of you have your, we call them different names, the people who come and help us in our homes. All the ladies, you know that? We call them maids, helpers, domestic help. Right? You remember? What if one day they don't turn up? Who is more affected, the servant or you? Are you sure? Now tell me who's greater. Look, Jesus never said anything loosely. When he was saying, right, whoever wants to be great must be your servant, he meant it. Because the one who serves is greater than one who is served. It's as simple as that. So we need to really get our mind right, our thought process right. Ananta is here, I'll pick on him. Uh, what are IAS officers called in India? Public servants or civil servants? The exam is called civil services, right? But do you like to be called civil servant? Do you like the word servant? What was supposed to be the highest is called civil servant. If you are still not convinced, what is the meaning of minister? One who serves. If you are a prime minister, chief servant. Now, how many of you want to be a minister and a prime minister? See, we, we got everything wrong. We got our minds muddled by the worldly way of thinking. That's the reason Paul writes in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of the world. Right? That's the pattern of the world. But Bible is the same at that time and even now. There is so much of truth. So I just want to encourage you to really get this, get this concept of leadership right. And unfortunately, Jesus didn't give us an option. Okay? So that's the theory part. Let me move on to the practical side. But what stops us? What are the big challenges for you and me in the corporate world to be the servant leader? Again, I'm talking about internal here. I'm not talking about outside people. Right? What stops us? I feel it is our ego. Uh, that's me and my photograph. So that's the kind of an egoistic person I am. And I deal with a lot of pride and sometimes fear. But I used to feel that I never had fear. I think something went wrong. Okay. Uh, but I used to feel I fear nobody. I fear nothing. That itself is a problem because that's a pride, right? So these are the two issues which I grapple with. And if you are very spiritual, want to be a servant leader, you will grapple with in the marketplace. But let me move into the practical side. And again, I will start with internal. What is the problem you and me face? The first problem I face is the spiritual pride. When you are in the marketplace, right? There are a lot of value conflicts. So we start judging others by our standards. Right? Unfortunately, we don't realize they don't know what we know. They don't operate on that standard. So first of all, I need to stop really judging people and need to really work on my spiritual pride. The second one, as I said, is judgmental spirit. The third one is fear of rejection. Uh, people like John Philip have a Christian name. He can't escape. But I didn't have a... I do have a Christian name, but it's hidden in between. Nobody knows it. Mohan Patnaik is what they know. It's fascinating. I, I worked in a bank in two different stints. So the first one, people know me as Mohan Patnaik. Right? Nobody knew me as a Christian, or very few people knew me as Christian. But uh, John can't hide because his name gives it away, right? So it so happened, that's the reason why I acquired Kalnaik title. But when I, seven years later, when I joined that bank again, this time they took my full name, which had a Moses in it, Mohan Moses Kumar. I still remember doing this video conference, global video conference, 
that half of them didn't know me from my first uh, stint. The other half knew me. And one of the lady, very senior executive, reports to the COO, she jumped and said, oh, your name is Moses. I never knew that during your first time. So suddenly, she thought, OK, here is a Christian guy. Right? I'll tell you another example how people uh, really kind of look at. The same bank, which, where I was known as very tough taskmaster, Kalnayak, the second time when I came, by that time, Lead Like Jesus happened, the transformation is happening. I became a very people's person. So I have developed this habit, which I would encourage you to try it out, because a lot of questions were, how do we witness at work, right? So this is some practice which I've been doing for many years, is this. I have lunch every day, right? That is officially allowed. So I make sure I have lunch with one new person every day. No agenda. And everybody's happy to have lunch with you because you're a senior guy. And they, they get worried. OK, Mohan wants to have lunch with me. And that too in the cafeteria. Right? They thought, I have two horns and all that. So I just go to the cafeteria, buy the same food, and sit in a quiet corner just to have a conversation. And it goes like this. Sometimes it's very strategic. Uh, if it is on a Friday, the conversation starts like, what's the plan for the weekend? And naturally, they will ask you, what are your plans? And I will tell everything which I do on the weekend. If it's on a Monday, you ask, what, was the, uh, what did you do over the weekend? So it's a very informal conversation. And our HR head observed this, and the news spread out. Mohan is having lunch meeting with somebody new every day. They are not his directs. He's even having lunch with the junior people, freshers. And he came, and he was a little worried. Sergey, I don't understand this. What happened to you? I said, nothing happened. No, you were not the same kind of a leader when you worked before. I know you very well. We used to be scared to come even near you because you are such a tough taskmaster. Now you are having lunch dates. Are you saying people see the transformation that God says it has happened? And I started loving people. Results are important. I was still very kind of obsessed with the results. But the way approach has changed. So the so fear of rejection is always there. But you don't need to worry. As uh, I think somebody said, never be ashamed. John said that. Never ashamed of God. Talking about being ashamed, uh, one of the things which never happened in my corporate career, I joined this, the last company. And when you join at senior level, first one month goes into doing introduction meetings. And I was meeting everybody over video conference, who's who. I met, never happened in my lifetime. Uh, so I met this gentleman who heads learning and development globally for the company. And we started talking. And I keep it very informal, first introduction meeting. And I share everything. And they, he, I asked him, how about your family? He never talk to me about his family. But fascinating was his response. And I will change the names. He said, his name is Nick. He said, that I'm married to Nick. I have a husband. His name is also Nick. And we chose not to have children. That stunned me. I was speechless for a few minutes. And they said, I didn't get into judging him, but what came to my mind is, here is somebody who believes in a lie, but so bold and courageous to say who he was. Here I am. When did I last tell? I'm a forgiven child of God. I'm a child of God and uh, saved by Jesus. Never. So never be ashamed. I'm not saying you need to go and give tracts in the office, never do that, right? I used to be like that. I still remember when my internet, the transformation of knowing my workplace as my calling happened, I was so jealous. I need to tell about my faith to everybody, particularly with my boss. So I'll tell you this <laughs> story because uh, it is both a, a story of failure as well as I've learned few things. So I was waiting for an opportunity. I was very open with him. 
Uh, we talked about work-life balance and all that. Uh, maybe I will tell that because there is a work-life balance question as well. When I was interviewed by him, he really liked and he wanted me desperately. So I agreed and I told my office and there is a guy who worked with him uh, many years before. He came to me and he said that your boss is a lovely guy, but I don't think it will work for you. I said, why? You are a guy who will never work nine hours, more than nine hours a day. You are very disciplined, work life and all that. But he works 16 hours, he works seven day a week. I don't think your chemistry will work. I said, good that you have told me. So I fixed up an appointment before I joined. I said, look, I want to tell my convictions, my values, my way of working. I'm totally responsible. That's the reason why you want to hire me. But I will not work more than nine hours. I will not work on weekends. And he immediately got a little hassle. And he said, no, 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 I don't expect others to work like that. And I was so bold. I said, look, uh, that is fine. But in a year's time, you also have kids of my, my kids' age. In a year's time, I want you to be like me. That's how our relationship started. So I was very keen, lovely guy, uh, chartered accountant, and I wanted to give him the gospel. So I was waiting for the opportunity. So one day he gave an interview in the Economic Times. I read, okay, he said that he likes reading autobiographies. Ah, the, here is my moment. He likes autobiographies. I know he was going on a holiday next day. I want to give him a book of Ravi Zacharias, Walking from East to West. So I keep all those books in my office. So I went, and my only agenda is to give the book. And I didn't realize one of my directors was with him on business discussion. I barged in. I said, look, I saw your interview. You enjoy autobiographies, uh, so I don't read books, but this is one of the rare books I've read, and it's really good, I think you will enjoy. It's a sealed one, not sealed in the sense, transparent one. I gave it to him. And he looked at front and back, he realized what it is. I was stunned at his response. He said, Mohan, why do you think, why do you Christians try to convert people? was his response. What do I do? And this he was saying in front of my director. I shouldn't have done that in front of him. And he responded like this. And I said the Nehemiah prayer, because I didn't have an answer, because that was not my mind. So I said, ne said a Nehemiah prayer. But God gave me that courage, and I responded. I said, why do you think by giving a book, I'm trying to convert you? Fascinating was his response. Listen to this carefully. Fascinating. These are the words he used. Three years back, one of my very close cousins became a born-again believer. This is the words he used. And since then, I can't speak to her without she speaking about Jesus to me. Right? He is witnessing. Right in front of my diary. Then I said, look, you said that she's very close to you. Do you think somebody can convert? Right? And tell me one thing. Is it wrong, if I'm blessed with something good, is it wrong to share that blessing with somebody you love? That's what I'm doing. Choice is yours. Whether you read the book or not, that's your choice. Because I was blessed, I want to bless you. Right? So that's how it has happened. So the learning is, be sensitive but also depend on God. Let's move on to the real factors which may be in your head. So which is the external factors. Conflict of values happens all the time because we live in a relativistic world where the absolutes are not there. Integrity issues, difficult people. I'll give you again one more true story. Again, the same bank I talked about my boss. Uh, I recruited this particular director, actually. Uh, and when you recruit at senior level, it's not always black and white. So when we recruited, uh, he was one of those fast trackers, bright IAM guy. And he was demanding a higher position, senior director. But in terms of number of years experience, he had less, because he's one of those fast trackers. And in order to attract him, we 
kind of a, had an agreement between HR, my boss, and me that we will take him at a director level. In a year's time, we will promote him without any interview process, auto promotion. So that's what was agreed. Sometimes I do some good things because you never know how long you'll be in the company. You know my track record, right? I already worked for eight companies. So I put it in mail to the HR and to my boss. This is what we have agreed. In a year's time, this guy needs to be promoted. Sure enough, a lot of things happen in a year's time in financial industry. That's when the financial crisis happened. And the next year, the results were bad, promotions were limited. So we had the promotion quota very, very small. And seven of us management committee meeting, everybody brings their promotion candidates, and you have a discussion. And sure enough, this guy's name was there because you need to promote, because that's what the commitment you have made. It is not in writing. Writing was internal. We didn't give it writing to the candidate. But he went by my word because he knew me. He, went, he just trusted me. And the conversation was between me and one more COO, my colleague. And he put on a candidate. And it was a tussle between these two, only one position. The discussion went like this, right? Now that we have, don't have a number of positions, we'll promote this person next year, we'll give to the other person. I said, look, but this is not an option because you have committed. Then he asked, did we commit in, in writing? I said, no, then we don't need to. There is no legal obligation. And my pride went like this, right? And I've said, raise my voice. Look, my word is better than a contract. At any cost, I will not allow it to happen. I raised my finger, raised my voice. Nobody expected it. And there was a hush. Yes, I was fighting for the right cause, but the way I fought it was not right. And my boss said, OK, we'll adjourn the meeting. We will come back. So that happened. Whole night, I couldn't sleep. I lost my peace. Right? Not because I did something wrong, the way I have handled the situation. Next day morning, I sent a mail to that gentleman, copied everybody in the management committee, and I said, look, though I still stick to my position, I'm terribly sorry. The way I have behaved is not right. Please forgive. And I copied everybody. Went into him, and he was coming. And I said, I'm sorry. And he couldn't look at it my eyes. Because he also knows that he was wrong. He, he didn't say sorry. He couldn't look at it my eyes. But my boss needs to solve the problem. The next day, my boss comes with a googly. You know what googly in cricket is? You expect it to turn this way, it will turn this way. And he sends me a mail. Mohan, I'm so happy with your performance. I'm recommending your promotion. OK? By the way, can we think about so-and-so next year? Because this is a separate quota. So what my boss was doing? He was trying to trade off, trying to get me on his side. Right? And I prayed and said, God, give me grace. I don't want to do the second mistake of being harsh on my boss. I prayed and sent him in writing. Okay, now that you have said this, I want to let you know, as long as I serve in this company, I'm not going to accept any promotion for myself. Right? Even if you give, I will decline. I don't want to put you in that embarrassing situation where somebody declines promotion, but I will fight for this guy. I'm, if you are not going to give him, I don't have a choice but to quit. Right? It is tough. So the reason I'm sharing is you'll get that. What do you choose? Is it a choice between your own kind of a position or do you fight for others? So we'll have discrimination, but Bible tells us God is our judge. Injustice happens all the time. Right? I'll give you one more story. I'm conscious that time is running out. And there are other issues of social outings and gossips and all that. I call myself as anti-social because 
uh, when you are in a senior position, obviously you can attend a dinner almost every day of the week. And we talked about work-life balance. There was a time when I had dinner invites with the customers every day of the week, which means your family time goes for a toss. So I have to unashamedly say, look, I tried in between. I said, I'll do two dinners in a week. I can't do five. But ultimately, the dinner meetings became lunch meetings because I was shamelessly declining them. So we need to kind of look into this. But one of the things I want to talk about, discrimination and injustice. Uh, I joined my last company. If you, I don't know whether you got it right or not. Third was my last working day uh, in the current company, Thomson Reuters, where I joined two and a half years back. How did I join? Lord led me. I have no reason. I never applied for any job in my lifetime. So there's a long story. I will not bore you with the details. God gave me that word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will. So that's the promise through which I joined. Two years later, earlier this year, uh, the company decides to sell half of the company. I was brought in to manage the entire company, and it becomes half. And all the power struggle starts. Discrimination starts. As much as they brought me in with a lot of fanfare, when your position is at stake, everybody will look at their own positions. So when the announcement happened, my HR head came to me and said, Mohan, this is the time all the power struggles happen. You need to be in New York, not in Bangalore to make sure that you fight for yourself. I said, I've never done that. I don't think I will do. But he was insisting. His intentions was right. He wanted to help me. No, from nowhere, this numbers came. And I didn't get the scripture. It said 1414. What is this 1414? Went home. And logically, I started with Genesis 1414. Didn't make any sense. Then I came to Exodus. There you go. It said, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. So what I want to say is, discrimination happens, injustice happens. When it happens to you and me personally, entrust it in the hand of the Lord. He will fight for you. Don't fight for yourself. That is selfishness. However, God also puts you in the marketplace to fight for others. The example I have given is, Fight for people who can't fight for themselves. Fight for your team. But when it comes to you, enter in the God's this thing. So it happened, and I was very much at peace because God clearly told me my assignment is going to come to an end. And there are a lot of people who are trying to make me look bad, right, as they try because there are very few positions. And when that big moment came, I made a presentation. I did my planning. I said, look, Every one of my nine direct reports needs to be safe. They need to be in the right positions. I put a reorg, presented to the entire executive committee, and basically it said, everybody has a role, and my role is redundant. So I made my role redundant. That was the proposal I made. You will not believe the people who were against me, including the global head of HR, they were speechless. They simply dropped their joy. I said, look, how can somebody do that? I could do that because God clearly told me my job is to take care of others and his job is to take care of me. Still, I don't know where I'm heading, but I know the one who knows where I'm heading. So think about when you are in the marketplace, it is not about you. It's about why God put you there and what you need to so challenges also comes with opportunities. And I'll kind of quickly go through this. We are called people. Right? We are called with a purpose at work. And unless we know that, we are called to be followers of Christ and not just to be witnesses. So we need to get that right. Witnessing is not a separate calling over my being a follower of Christ. Hope you are getting. Witnessing is what you say and share. Our lifestyle should imitate Christ so that they, they should know this person is different. 
One day my boss called me weird. In the context of money, I did exceptionally well that year, took two responsibilities, saved around 10 million for the company, and I, I thought I was one of the best performers. That's when he, he gave me very minimal increment. So much so he couldn't even face me. He texted me, you know, company results are not good. I know you will understand. I became a soft target because he knows I don't care for money because I know where money comes from. And, my, and he didn't expect the response I had. I said, I'm so grateful for the 2% increment you have given me because every rupee I'm grateful to God. And his response was, Mohan, you are weird. Because he didn't expect that. It didn't end there. The next day when he was in office, I went in there. He couldn't see me eye to eye. He knows that he just was unfair. I said, look, I'm not worried about this 2%. I just want you to ask yourself this question. Were you fair to me? His head was brought down. And for a few minutes, complete calmness, he said, I know I wasn't, but can you give me some time to correct my wrong? He went against his own decision. He has to get a CEO special sign off to really do justice to me. See, sometimes it is not about you. It is about, that's what for me is just being the follower of Christ. Ministry is not a project. It's a lifestyle. Again, when we, whenever you talk about ministry, understand the meaning of ministry. It is about serving. Right? Our, our lifestyle should be is, I'm called to serve. Jaya knows this. Many years back when Lead Like Jesus happened, uh, we had kids were very small, uh, 10, 4, uh, 10, 7, and 4. And in our prayer, uh, morning prayer, everybody should say, I'm called to serve. And they need to put a question mark, who will I serve today? And in the evening, they need to come back to the family prayer. I'm called to serve, who did I serve today? And everybody needs to tell their stories. The little girl who was four, I helped my teacher carrying the books. And once we went for the parent-teacher meeting, and the teacher was, how do you bring up your kids? I said, what happened? This little girl troubles me every day. Teacher, teacher, I want to help, I want to help. At what day I asked, why you want to help me daily? I need to tell my dad in the family prayer. The reason I'm saying is, serving should become a lifestyle. See, the beautiful part of serving is, when you start thinking about serving others, you're not thinking about yourself, you're thinking about others, that's what we are called to do. You don't see others as, Selfish people, you don't see others as anybody. You see them as people to be loved and to be served. You don't judge them. So that's what the ministry meaning means. Our purpose is in the future, not here. Our purpose of work is to glorify God. We work for the Lord and the reward comes from Him. And we have said enough of times, Colossians 3, 23, 24, but we need to focus on the things that have eternal consequences. Let me tell you, friends, only thing which has eternal consequences is people. This morning I opened the newspaper. The deputy mayor, who was 44 years old, got elected last week, died like that. Our time is, we don't know. Tomorrow can be our time, right? Love people. People have eternal consequences. So then your perspective of work completely changes. Finally, demonstrate Christian leadership. Our words should reflect the lifestyle, right? Do I do what I say? Do my words build others up or kind of tear them down? Consistency of actions and words. In terms of the leadership as the influence, one of the things my major learning in the last few years is a good leader will be great listeners. In workplace, you know, we do 360 degree survey. The last survey that was done, I have a global team, I have six country heads and all that. They put it very nicely. 
one of my area to develop was I need to listen more. Okay? And I'm telling you, listening is a good servant leader's trait. What basically they were saying is, I need to talk less. If I miss the point. In, you know, my thinking was, I'm the leader. We have a, a, a fortnightly team meetings. I set the agenda. I need to speak. But how do I implement this feedback? Again, I prayed. God gave me this great idea. He said, yes, you are the boss. And that's what Jesus said. I, your master and teacher, I am your master and teacher, rightly so. But I, being your teacher, I wash your feet, so you must do it. So yeah, my position doesn't change. So God gave me this idea. Yes, meetings are there. Yes, you are the boss. But you don't need to chair. So one of the ways I will be a better listener is make every country head direct reports to chair the meeting by rotation. No favoritism. Let them set the agenda. Let them discuss. You will become a good listener. And I've made it very clear. This is what you have said, and I want to implement. This is how I want to implement. By the way, only you ask me if you need my opinion. Until then, I'm not going to, unless you are doing something really wrong. Right? So that's how I implemented. So the reason I'm saying is, you cannot just say all the guy right things, but you need to do things. Consistency of actions and words. Love people. There is no other option to be a good leader is to love people. And love people to empower a person to become what God they want them to be. Uh, develop a hidden potential, so which means developing of people is your only agenda. Uh, maybe I'll tell the last story, and this has happened with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Many years back, I told you that when I was in that fast track, one of my boss from UK uh, asked me whether I would like to go and get promoted and set up this office. I said, fine. And I came to Bangalore. As a courtesy, I sent her a mail saying that I'm so grateful and thankful that uh, you trusted me and promoted me. I'll do my best to keep to your trust. Fascinating was her response. I don't know how many of you and me will do that. She said, you fully deserve what you got. You have so much potential in you that one day I would like to work under you. How often we can say that to our people? Right? Think about it. That's what is servant leadership. The challenge, speak the words of God, live the words of God, and love the people that are God's. Yeah? So, with that, I want to kind of uh, tell you this story uh, and close. Uh, I talked about 2007. Anand Pillai was one of the faculty there, right? He sowed that seed, right? I was one of the beneficiaries, right? In an apple, how many seeds are there? Generally five or six. You can count, right? But do you know how many seeds are there in each apple? How many apples are there in each seed? Right? That's what we are called to be. Don't think you need to change the world, friends. Influence is all about changing lives one at a time. You don't know how many lives that life you influenced changes. So leadership is all about influence. The question and the challenge to you and me is, how are you influencing Right? We, each one of us in this room, are blessed to be a blessing, not to keep it to yourself. On that note, God bless you. Hopefully this is of some help. Thank you so much.